Exactly 100 days after the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, we have our first guilty plea from someone arrested after the riots. Sources tell NBC News that John Schaefer, a longtime member of the far right group, the Oath Keepers, has admitted to his role in the insurrection to federal prosecutors. You can see Schaefer in these images right here, armed with what appears to be bear spray as he and other pro-Trump rioters stormed the Capitol. Joining me now is NBC News Justice Correspondent Pete Williams. So, Pete, getting a guilty plea from somebody like like him, somebody within the Oath Keepers, what's that going to mean for the investigation? Well, it could potentially be a very important development here because this is the first guilty plea. Now, we always expected there would be lots of guilty pleas in this case because you've got a lot of people that are charged with fundamentally, you know, glorified trespassing charges. Many of them will probably plead out. But this is significant because authorities say he is a member of the Oath Keepers. He describes himself in court papers as a founding lifetime member of the Oath Keepers. And he says he admits that he was among the very first to get into the Capitol, the sort of vanguard of people that breached the Capitol building. So the government's theory here is by getting these uh, plea agreements, they can begin to get cooperation. And Schaefer did agree to cooperate today and start to peel back the layers on exactly who was in charge of this? Who planned this? Who came up with the idea of storming the Capitol? Who was really in charge once those people started to get into the building? So it's an important development there. It's a technique that prosecutors often use to build cases as they try to get the answers to the question about who's ultimately really responsible for this. How did the hearing go today? I mean, does he feel safe now that he's entered a guilty plea, now that he will be, I guess, in, in essence, speaking to investigators? Well, he didn't indicate that he didn't feel safe, and it was pretty clear that this was going to happen, because earlier this month there was a court document inadvertently uh, filed in the clear that should have been under seal, indicating that his lawyers were in intense plea discussions with the government. And his lawyer says today that this is they've been sort of on this uh, path for a long time. So he'll now be released from custody. He plays in a heavy metal band called Iced Earth, and he'll be able to continue to do that back in Indiana, whether he feels now uh, in any way vulnerable because he's going to be basically uh, ultimately talking about what he knows about the Oath Keepers. If that was a concern of his, he didn't express it today. Pete Williams, Pete, thank you so much. And again, it has been 100 days since that deadly riot at the Capitol. While much of the physical damage has been repaired, for those who experienced that day, the physical, the physiological, psychological scars still do remain. I couldn't get that. Just listen. I couldn't get that close because at that point I was tackled and they stole my helmet, took my helmet. They tried to get my gas mask. It was all these surreal things like this cannot be happening. This cannot be happening. This this cannot be happening. But it was. You know, I have moments. Um, it comes back in like flashes and it's hard to not have it with you every day for those of us that work at the Capitol still. That was Capitol Police Lieutenant Rainey Brooks describing her experience during the insurrection. It is part of a powerful project compiled by NBC News reporter Frank Thorpe that you can find on NBCNews.com. Lawmakers are also struggling with the painful memories. Congressman Dan Kildee revealed to NBC News this week that he sees a therapist to deal with post-traumatic stress from the incident. And lawmakers are grappling with security concerns as well. As Punchbowl News reports today, members of Congress have spent tens of thousands for security for themselves and their families, particularly the handful of Republicans who voted to impeach Donald Trump and then face death threats for doing so. And 100 days later, we're also just starting to learn about the multitude of failures and missed warnings before the attack, all laid out by the inspector general of the Capitol Police, in his damning report on response this week. Still, there is no 9-11 style commission on what happened, and it looks like we might never see one. There's also been no bill combating domestic extremism signed into law either. With me now is Punchbowl News founder Jake Sherman. He was there that day at the Capitol. So, Jake, uh, given what we've heard from the inspector general, what we've heard from the Capitol police, what we're hearing 
from these indictments, I find it mind boggling that Congress wouldn't want to do more to combat a threat that targets them. Yeah, well, two points, Katie. Number one, there's the disagreement about this panel, this 9-11 style panel. Um, Republicans want to broaden it to feature all forms of political violence. Violence and Nancy Pelosi's view, and and a lot of people are with her even quietly on the Republican side, that it should focus on January sixth. That this is that this was an attack on the building in which we all work in and Congress meets in, and it should be focused on that. Nancy Pelosi says everything else is nego negotiable about this, Katie. The number of Republicans on it, the number of Democrats on it, how much it's going to spend, how long it's going to go. She's fine with negotiating on any of those things, but she's not fine with negotiating on the scope, which is a position. And frankly, that a lot of people agree with. Then there's the other side of this, which is uh, Nancy Pelosi in the next week or two or three or four, we anticipate, is going to release a $2 billion security spending bill to fortify the Capitol. This is going to be a very different building, Katie, since the last time you were here and the building that I kind of grew up as a reporter being in. It's going to be fortified with removable fences. It's going to have a lot more police presence. It's going to just be a very different building because I, I, I think that people have come to the conclusion that it's just a big target in the middle of the city, like a sore thumb, so to speak. And, um, you know, listen, I, I, it's politicized like everything else, and it's horrible to say, but it has turned into a, a, a proxy for, you know, the right versus left issues that we all kind of hear about all the time. But it kind of folds into what we've been talking about all show and what we, what we have been talking about now for too many years, which is you're, you're treating the symptoms, you're not treating the underlying cause. So in fortifying the capital even more, you're not treating the the symptoms. You're you're not treating the cause of what's 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 happening there. You're not uh, finding a way to pass a domestic terrorism law. You're not treating the issue of domestic terrorism and what is giving rise to it. Instead, you're just trying to protect yourself with walls and barriers. It, it feels like. Do they actually expect anything to get better? Or, I mean, isn't there a sense of personal responsibility, moral responsibility for the safety of not just themselves and their families, but the country at this point? Well, I would say this, I would, uh, and I'm going to be very careful with how I put this, but um, I, I think when you don't root out the problem when it's in the building, I mean, when you have members of Congress who say things that are widely considered racist, that are widely considered um, uh, white supremacist trope, and you don't root out the problem, forget the country, Katie, when you don't root out the problem here in the Capitol, where I am right now, among members of Congress, then it's very difficult to try to solve larger societal ills. And we haven't seen the Republican leadership do that in, in many cases. We've seen once with Steve King, who had, had made a lot of racist comments over the years, uh, was finally removed from his committee and lost a a primary challenge in his home state of Iowa. But it's difficult to treat the larger societal ills without um, without dealing with what happens in this building. Power corrupts. It's a cliche for a reason. Jake Sherman. Jake, thank you very much. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. You should know that you can follow today's top stories and breaking news and catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.